Good morning, everybody from Stockholm, Sweden. Um, today, we're going to be talking about procedural badge creation um, with designer um, in, in 2042. So, I am Clay. I'm a senior UI artist here at DICE. Um, I've been here about a year and a half. Uh, I have 15 years of experience doing primarily UI and all different facets of UI, UI art, experience design, implementation. Um, yeah. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Peter Davisual. Uh, I've been working in the games industry for uh, 14 years now. I started with the journey as an environment artist and then moved to technical art. Uh, I've been working as a technical artist in the industry for 10 years now. Uh, and uh, been here at DICE for uh, two or so, a little more than two years. And uh, I really like uh, working with uh, artists, collaborating with artists and you know doing tools and workflows with them, empowering them. Yeah, so in the talk, we're going to talk about uh, what a badge is, and then we're going to talk about um, some of the problems we had in pre-production and then in production. Um, and then we're going to talk about just our plan and um, how we tackle production once we, once we actually transition into production. Um, and then we'll talk about our process. Um, we'll have a little bit of a demo in there, um, just with some videos we'll talk over. Um, and then we'll talk about what we learned and how we're going to move forward with this pipeline that we built up for these badges. Um, and then we'll have a, a Q and A where everybody can ask us all kinds of fascinating questions. Uh, yeah, so here's um, kind of a, it's a video um, showing off our, part of our front end. Um, and it's primarily where the badges live. and uh, Badges are given to the player for um, completing different tasks inside of the game. Um, you know, everything you can you can use in the in the game usually has a badge associated with it. So, like weapons, gear, vehicles, etc. Um, and then they can get equipped on player cards, so the player can you know show off achievements and peacock a little bit um, to the other players in the game. But they're also used. Um, as kind of a breadcrumb for players. So, you know, a player can see how far they are along in progression on a given item. Um, they can, you know, see where they want to spend their time next. So it's just, yeah, it's kind of like a, just a breadcrumb for players to look at and, and, um, and see how awesome they are at a given thing. So yeah, that's kind of showing off. This, these screens show off kind of like where, they're, where they primarily live in the UI, but they live in other places as well. This is just to kind of demo um, the majority of use case. And then, yeah, moving on. Um, so a badge is really just two things. It's a shape background, um, and that shape background is primarily done in designer, actually almost exclusively done in designer. Um, and then we have the hero foreground, and the hero foreground is it's typically any of the items um, a player would use in the game. So again, it's a weapon, vehicle, gadget, etc. Um, but they can also be um, other things that the player might do in the game. So like you know, distance traveled or something like that, where there's not a, a direct uh, correlation to the item in the game that the that the player might unlock. Um, and then the badges are composited together, or sorry, the, the, the background and the foreground are composited together to, to make the final badge. And then here, uh, we're seeing a final tier set. So there's five tiers um, in a set, and then the design grows with complexity as the, uh, as the badges tier up. And, uh, and like they maintain a consistent language as the player moves through the batch progression. Um, and they get a little more complex and you know, with their materials and their shape language. Um, so yeah, one of the big problems we had was we had to make hundreds of these badges. 
Um, and we're a relatively small team, so like it's no small feat to like try and generate. Um, I think at launch we were we we I we initially had around a thousand badges that got scaled back to six hundred, um, and then I like I forget where we ended up launching with, but it it, it was still quite a few um, north of four hundred. Um, and so there wasn't a lot of famili uh, familiarity with um, with substance on the team. Um, very little experience with 3D generally on, on the UI team. Um, so that was a challenge, um, big problem. And then we needed something that was going to be fast and that we could um, we could we could build out and disseminate that information to other team members and have them pick up um, pretty quickly. And then you know be flexible and responsive to any art direction in pre-production, and then of course in every production there's time, right? So um, pretty big um, time limitation, I think, for that scale. Um, looking back, I think we did all right, but yeah, that's, it, I'm sure as most people know, that's that's always the um, you know the 600 pound gorilla in the room is time. Yeah, so um, prior to coming up with this pipeline, the way I might do this in the past is, you know, model something up in Maya or ZBrush, output some maps, composite those together um, in Painter, um, and come up with something at the end of that. Um, the problem with that is it's hard to maintain consistency. Um, from asset to asset without some sort of like specialized pipe, um, which we kind of didn't end up doing as an aside, but um, you know, kit bashing, I wouldn't recommend. Um, and then you're also kind of limited. You can't really, um, you can't really change the process once it's set up. Um, you know, if you go the, the brute force route, um, and then on top of that, you really need somebody in the team who's like, they have a very specific style that you usually hire for. And, um, and then that's kind of all they do in production is like, they just generate assets. Um, so that, you know, any production can be a risk of, you know, you have one person and all they do is one thing and that's all they know how to do. So. Yeah, so this guy's really interesting, Nicola. If you guys don't um, follow this guy, he's on Twitter. Um, he's the lead artist at Mordius. He's, he's in all kinds of places. And I'm pretty sure Substance knows about him or people generally know about him. But yeah, we I talked to him before I started at Dice just because he had a workflow that was really interesting to me um, in, um, this, in you know, this batch creation process that they used at Mordius. Um, so, my manager here at Dice, when I started, he and I started talking, and you know, he was already aware of Nicholas, so we brought him in to talk about his process that they used to tackle their um, their their batch pipeline. Um, so yeah, we learned some interesting stuff from him. Um, uh, he's super knowledgeable, super interesting guy. Um, but yeah, I think we can talk more about like some of this stuff yeah. that we learned from him. So yeah, as uh, as uh, Clay mentioned, like uh, and Nicholas' uh, workflow, like the demo was kind of our starting point or inception of uh, how we kind of uh, tackle the situation here as well. So while his workflow was really nice, the way he used Houdini and Substance, but uh, then we when we looked at our requirements uh, in game, uh, you know, we had certain challenges, unique challenges for us as well. Uh, so. My uh, like Descartes' key focus was to like simplify the process so that you know UI artists don't jump around from different softwares, keep the technicality uh, to the low so that they can focus more on art. Um, and there were other challenges uh, like the game mess integration and uh, you know how to keep the workflow collaborative between teams as well. So those are certain unique challenges to us and in in the next slides you will see how we tackle the challenges. So, real quick, yeah, and like they also their their team is primarily a 3D team. So yeah. Highly specialized and you know very confident in that area whereas we were pretty weak on it. So we yeah. had to keep that in mind coming out of that talk. Exactly. 
So uh, we we went to the drawing board once we had the session. Then we started talking about how how we tackle the situation here. So we started you know uh, planning these out in uh, Miro, where you know uh, the initial phase is basically understanding each other, like UI art and tech art. Tech art didn't know how UI art works or what the final expected outcome is. So one of the process was uh, Clay would like go back and just focus on uh, ideation, like what is the end result that he wants uh, or UI team wants and just do it like however you want in substance you know we just want to see the final output not necessarily uh, getting bogged down on technical details of how you do it you know just just do it however you uh, like so we kept that iteration going uh, back and forth where I got a lot better understanding of uh, you know uh, what the outcome was, and looking at the, his batch, older batch uh, graphs, uh, I could then come up with ideas on templates of what can be templated, what can be converted to utilities. You know that that was like a really good uh, in initial prototype phase. Um, yeah, and then one of the focus area for me was like keep the iteration really fast, uh, not only while developing the workflow, but also when let's say in a potential future where workflow is developed the ui team should be able to like iterate on individual assets in a much faster way so that was my focus as well so yeah so uh this is the start of the process um basically um before the process itself one of our key goal was to establish a way to like you know deploy the workflow and the tools and the materials so that the collaboration can start rolling out. So for that, we have Cadet. This is a EA-wide uh, tool for uh, deploying other tools like VCC tools and uh, uh, content library as well. So uh, this is the tool we use to like share workflows and uh, you know uh, shape libraries and material libraries, as you can see here. Uh, this also helps us standardize software versions you know, Substance Designer also is like very locked down to one version supports one uh, certain things and you need to upgrade the data to the next version. So in, in that way, we managed it to connect pretty nicely and it helped us a lot. So this was like one of the key tools which uh, allowed us to share the Substance 3D Designer's UI workflow with the team. So at the start of the process, uh, 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 there was Houdini. So we used Houdini as like a backend tool to uh, digest the highest meshes that is uh, that like uh, that is going to be in the batch and uh, take the highest mesh and generate a simplified mesh. Why we need a simplified uh, preview mesh is a uh, high level of interaction. Again, the feedback artists need things fast. They don't want they don't like things slow as you might know. So uh, hence we needed to. Uh, we found this solution for like uh, like uh, making a preview mesh so that they can interact with it uh, easier. Then uh, the high risk mesh was also used to generate height map in in uh, in Houdini. Uh, we had a couple of reasons to choose Houdini versus Substance because uh, you know the baking pipeline of Substance was like because our substance designer knowledge was also low, so we needed a, a lot more automatic solution and there are other reasons for this as well, I'll talk that later. But uh, yeah, we used substance uh, Houdini to generate the height map and the opacity map mask in Houdini. But then the interesting thing happens, you take that map and you plug it into substance automation toolkit running inside Houdini to generate this graph on the right side you see. So, this is pretty much the demo of what I just spoke about. So uh, in Houdini, uh, you plug in the mesh to this uh, Houdini digital asset and there's certain controls where, you know, you can see the preview mesh getting generated. You can change the resolution of it a bit more if you want to see more definitions. You can change the orientation and you can see the feedback is like really fast. And the padding and texture size, those kind of things are also there. And when you hit the back button, then uh, it generates the image and then Substance Automation Toolkit takes over and generates a graph out of it. You can see the graph back in Substance 3D Designer. This graph is based on a template again, which Substance Automation Toolkit uh, uses uh, and it has pre-parameterized, uh, you know, it's a pre-parameterized uh, graph and, uh, you know, each 
So uh, the image is just plugged in and the input and everything else is there. There's some simple controls of rotation and uh, normal intensity, uh, you know, as you can see in the video. So back in Houdini, uh, we'll dive deep more into how the Houdini tool itself works. Um, uh, so the mesh goes in and uh, there's a functionality to generate uh, a volume or VDB from a high-risk mesh. And then we convert that back to polygon. And then we cache it so that we don't generate this intensive process again and again. Again, all about keeping the workflow fast. Uh, then we use the functionality called max size to uh, like basically uh, convert any asset of any size to our required size. This was again Nicola's idea as well. And then height map generation, as I mentioned, with Houdini's functionality. This uh, uses high-risk mesh. It shows low risk, but it actually uses the high-risk mesh to generate the height map, so we don't compromise quality. Then fi finally outputs uh, like height map and other masks. We haven't used all the channels. We just used R and alpha, but in future we can use those channels. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Then finally, the big uh, button that actually runs the substance automation toolkit. So we have attached a Python script to the big button where uh, the kind of final magic happens of generating the substance graph. A uh, few hundred lines of code, it's mostly around connecting parameters. And I was like, this was my like uh, early days with uh, Substance Automation Toolkit as well, like in using it in this way. So, but it was super handy and easy to use as well. Uh, you know, once you know it, it's quite powerful on what you can do. Like you can create a graph from scratch. It's quite empowering actually. Yeah, that's, that's about it. Uh, so, uh, that was really, but as I mentioned, like we didn't want to introduce a new software to uh, our UI team. UI team was already like small, there was a time limitation. We wanted to also keep the pipeline slim and uh, you know easy to approach. So, what we had then is Maya. Maya, uh, our UI team already knew Maya, and then another reason of choosing Maya is all our uh, source files are uh, like built in Maya. You know, uh, so all the highest messages and everything. So we have an in-house tool which kind of allows us to go through all our assets in in game and easily filter what we want. So in conjunction to that, we have another kind of framework in Maya which takes the Houdini tool and renders exactly the same UI that we designed in Houdini, as you can see on the right side. So that kind of working, making it uh, work together would give a nice little workflow in Maya to generate the kilo asset graph. So you can see in the demo video next, this is basically the starting point of an artist, how easily they can generate um, uh, height maps for for the hero meshes uh, without any learning Houdini or any complex tool. It's pretty simple. Like if you know basics of Maya, you can use this tool to generate high maps. Yeah, I would even say if you didn't. Like, I mean, obviously you need some, but like, yeah, it's it's a really easy tool to use once you understand just the basics of it. Yeah. So what I show here is when you load the uh, Maya file, then you filter out what exactly do you need to be available in the batch. And then you hide everything else, and uh, then you plug that mesh into our Houdini tool. You can see it's quite high risk, but in once you see the interaction, it's quite fast. Yeah. Before we didn't have the fast preview. Yeah, 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 exactly. It was like not so awesome. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. This is a result of the feedback. Yeah, yeah. So this is yeah, collaboration, yeah. right? Yeah. This was not the tool on the first day. Uh, if you can, <laughs> yeah. So, so feedback loop is very much necessary for developing these uh, workflows. So here I'm getting the asset name and putting it here so that it uh, appropriately uh, publishes to our uh, library. So the big exactly does the same thing that I showed in Houdini as well. And uh, we have the graph open here, which we can see the real time update here itself. There you go. Yeah, graphs are 
like the images are always baked in a very high resolution and these graphs are related to say it's actually related to parent uh, uh, so that yeah it can be scalable later down the pipe everything else is mostly the same like um and here uh, i think this is the most empowering part of about that creation now the artist goes back to maya switches the orientation clicks and bake and sees the result here this is even more empowering when you go into assembly graph where everything is set up with foreground and background and then you want to change some angle in maya and then bake and everything updates and it just like you see the final asset instantly uh, with this kind of iteration. Yeah. Then the final step of the process is in substance 3D design. -off. This is where everything kind of comes together. Um, so the starting point is uh, basically templates. We rely on templates. We had like few templates, like three templates. One for a uh, foreground mesh, the hero mesh, uh, that is used by the substance automation toolkit to kind of uh, generate the graph. Uh, and then we had a tier set graph and a DM asset graph, uh, the, the assembly graph, basically. So you can see the screenshots of uh, these graphs individually. So I believe the templates are very. Uh, very nice and the way we use it is like to bring the complexity down uh, include documentation so a person opens the graph and they can kind of know what to do and we kind of define the workflow in there like if you see the bottom right corner this like assembly materialization rendering it's quite segregated so it's pretty new user friendly to the workflow you know so um, that really kept the complexity down it's always not uh, like this, like uh, beautiful looking. You can see, you will see uh, graphs in the few, like in the few slides uh, further that it could grow complex uh, organically. But we, it's always good to plan things out early on and uh, have that base to start with, you know. And then we can iterate on it gradually. You know? So, yeah. This also meant like uh, parameterization and standardization was uh, like uh, really good uh, in our workflow and this left less room for error as well. So demo time. Oh no, before demo time. So there's, uh, there's uh, the, on the left side you can see a old graph from early on like uh, in the concept phase and on the right side there's a uh, new wish graph of which uses our template as well. You yeah. want to speak so this? the old graph, yeah, that's like uh, me fumbling around in designer trying to figure out how to make things work, how to get things kind of semi decent. Um, and yeah, like PB said, this is one of the ones that he and I, I gave to him. He dissected. He came back to me with another um, presentation on on a different way to work. Um, and then the new graph is like our latest and greatest. It's just. Um, you know, I guess over a year now of iteration. Um, and I think in a sec, you may see kind of our, our mid-production graph, which was, was still like pretty sloppy and like really didn't consider, um, you know, the full use of libraries um, and then and structure and organization in, in the graphs. So here's the demo of the uh, final workflow in Substance. So here you can see a tier set uh, graph where we assemble uh, five tiers as described before, where we have like this shape library is either built from vectors done in Adobe Illustrator or completely procedural. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, artists come in and plug and play and they can use any kind of Substance node, but the final output stays the same like based on the template. So you generate, set up your height map, your uh, material masks and your opacity mask. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so yeah, this this graph is primarily about it's just all about heights and and masks. And this is back in the assembly graph where this really where the, you know all the magic happens. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. It, yeah. It helps you reduce complexity. And then this is the generated uh, uh, batch, like the hero asset graph. You can see the library on the left hand side. Uh, these are generated already and then you can quickly drag and drop any existing uh, asset and, uh, you know, switch things around, try A-B testing on maybe 
this weapon looks better on this background, you know, things like that. Um, this is, by the way, programmer art. This is not a final draft. This is me fumbling around and just testing a process. Uh, so I, I don't want to say that this is like created by artists. This, uh, looks, it, it doesn't look good. You will see actual draft here on the line. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, so we heavily used uh, PBL render node. That's actually one of the core nodes behind which kind of defines the beauty of the final batch. Yeah, it, I think it was a revelation by Nikola. Uh, yeah. Said, yeah. Yeah. Nikola, Nikola uh, in, his, in his workflow used the, the PBR node to render the final asset out. Um, and yeah, we leveraged it quite a bit um, just to achieve some of the looks we wanted to achieve. Um, without that note, I don't, we would have probably had to consider a different way to render these out. The, the early on, I was uh, screwing around with iRay, trying to make that work just to get some, you know, decent renders out of that. Looks good, but we always ran into the problem of, of camera, so getting a consistent badge angle, um, you know, just it wasn't possible with the knowledge we had and the time we had. I mean, there, maybe a way we could have done it but otherwise yeah it was marmoset or something else to render these out or arnold um but yeah we uh found the pbr node and yeah it worked out great uh it can you know fake 3d i think ish um so yeah it has camera settings and offset settings and um you yeah. know some way to push some different parameters that you know make the badge uh look extra cool um, and then you can, you know, like most of you can say about presets. So um, I would often get a request to, you know, make some fancy looking marketing art or something. And, um, you know, I could put some doff on the badge and make it look extra sexy and send it off to marketing, whoever needed it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was a great note to have in production. Yeah. Um, here you can see uh, a custom note that we had made uh, for it. A sheet. Uh, I feel like this this node was quite empowering as well in terms of like having the visibility of all the five badges and have control over it. So this kind of combines them all together while keeping a focus on one badge, and you can like change whatever you want and just have like a director's view of uh, uh, you know the change. So you can kind of bring in standardization. Are all the badges working together or not? So this was pretty easy to build this graph, uh, like uh, this little utility in Substance as well, uh, just basic uh, task concludes. Um, then here I'm showing the outputs, there's nothing fancy going on here, just simple plain outputs. It has a little bit of user data, which is used in exportation later down the line. But yeah, so here's an actual production graph and you can see like uh, <laughs> this doesn't give justice to uh, the, the quality that uh, that uh, substance can bring up with the power of like artists creativity you know so yeah uh, here the exploitation we pretty much use the substance is uh, basic exploitation um and uh, yeah the, the lighting yeah so lighting lighting was something um uh i like i didn't have a ton of experience with going into this so yeah i like fumbled my way through that um but yeah had uh, like halfway through production um, I, I, you know, I early on I tried some HDRs in in, in uh, our internal library and some of the, the the substance provided HDRs. Nothing quite worked, so I ended up building my own. Um, in hindsight, I like I would have put that into a library instead of doing it directly in the graph and just exposing some parameters on that graph and um, and using those directly in, in the assembly graphs and and you know then that way. You know, if I wanted to change something on the fly, I could do it, um, and it would populate to all the uh, corresponding graphs. But yeah, hindsight is twenty twenty, as they say. <laughs> all right, um, move on. So here's the uh, recap of the process. So we, this is like for hero batch generation, we use Houdini and Substance Automation Toolkit to define the logic. Uh, which is responsible for generating the graph from an input mesh. Then we take that logic into Maya, and that's where the, like uh, the UI team starts working on. And uh, they load the mesh uh, and uh, plug it into the Houdini wrapper tool we have, 
and generate this optional stuff from there. Then finally, in Substance 3D Designer, that's where the artist spends most of the time. Where they take the generated hero graph, they work on the tier sets, and then finally do the assembly together. Uh, so yeah. So yeah, here's just here's just a uh, uh, early early badges. Um, yeah, so the ones in the upper right were just the IRA stuff, and you can kind of see the angles are a little bit off. Um, yeah, and that's, that's still using kind of the brute force approach where I was still trying to wrap my head around designer. Um, and yeah, so I was still generating some maps here and there, just reassembling them and basically using designer as more of a rendering tool. Um, the lower ones are getting closer to what we ended up going with in production, and those like as I learned more and more of designer, just like the um, more and more of the badges were made um, in designer. Like I, I had this aha moment where, you know, um, uh, the magic of it became apparent to me. <laughs> and then, yeah, these are some of the final results. Um, just using our, our, our pipe to, uh, to make some, some, some decent looking badges. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is just a small sample. Like I said, there's um, there are, there's there's 600 plus of these, and we use this pipeline for some other assets in the game as well. So, you know, we kind of extended it a little bit. Um, yeah, and the cool thing is, is like this set is all like they're not really using any assets from um, within the game. Um, they're all custom made, either within designer or um, yeah, I I. I would quickly like the swords, like you know, quickly modeled up in in Maya. Um, flag was modeled in Maya, so yeah, just taking those and using our hero asset generator to um, kick those out of Maya and bring them back into substance as a height map and build the badge out. Um, so yeah. All right. Final result. Yeah. So finally, on the learnings. Uh, the first one about understanding, improve, uh, like uh, uh, you know, improving our understanding on Substance City Design. This was like uh, we knew it early on itself that you know, um, later uh, we are planning our, out our in-house training sessions uh, to kind of improve our understanding on 3D Design. Keep up to date with like amazing updates that they bring in with uh, you know every iteration uh, and. Uh, that will help us like use the graphs more optimally and then at the end like you know it doesn't take that much time to render and then we can do things in a much better way so that's one of our you know first things to tackle internally then the second one was syncing foreground and background angles that means the shape on the the hero badges uh, so now while in maya we can like change the orientation and uh, render things out um, but the bank, uh, angle of the whole badge is kind of half defined in designer and half defined in Maya. So if you change one angle, it may not feel thematically connected. So we want to bring in some kind of relation there. We don't know how that will be, but that's something we're exploring. Um, then the third one, which is my favorite one, is bringing the input work map workflow right inside Substance 3. While like the Houdini Maya workflow looks cool and it works uh, functionally, uh, it's still, you know, jumping the hoops uh, quite a lot, uh, and I I would love to bring that context directly inside Substance 3D. So we were thinking early on about import imposter sheets to pre-render multiple angles, and so artists can change the angles easily inside Substance. But now with Substance model graph, we may you know uh, make that happen uh, another way. So we are we are looking at exploring those scenarios. Then. Yeah, just like I mentioned before about environment and lighting, it's just something that um, it was more of a learn along the way kind of thing. And um, yeah, I, had, I would have much rather put those into a library and um, and and use those um, yeah in more of a distributed fashion than kind of a one-off inside each graph. Um, but again, like you know, having having a PBR node to even hook lighting into. Yeah. was um was a game changer but yeah i mean like that's one area where i think like we would like to have um more control in the future yeah um uh, regarding batch processing 
No, 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 it's yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so uh, batch processing was, is one of the things that's like, I think, the superpower of Substance ecosystem because with Substance Automation Toolkit and with Substance is uh, Substance 3D Design as Python API itself, you can do quite a lot of things. Uh, we have explored certain things as you might have seen, but we haven't done batch processing to, not, to an extent what we want to do, like global changes on certain things, uh, you know, um, certain parameters all around the globe. Because we have followed templates and we have certain standard utilities, we can do that now, but we haven't tried it. So that's something we would like to try in the future. Then the last one is generating batch right inside our engine. So this is our early days uh, where like uh, Substance has been integrated into Frostbite now. So we are looking at maybe, you know, uh, soon try out like a batch generator right inside Frostbite, which is like created using Substance 3D Designer and you kind of plug a 3D mesh inside Frostbite and generate the batch. So it's still dreamy, but we, we like to challenge ourselves to those kind of ideas and uh, we are, yeah, we'll see how that happens. Um, yeah, so lastly, uh, this is not just two of us or even two teams, this is the whole of EA like uh, helping us out in this in some form uh, a way. So thanks to all of these uh, nice uh, people around DICE, EA Create and the Pellet Developer team who kind of made this a reality. So thanks to all of you. Come on, it was just us. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, that's about it. Uh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys very much. That was an uh, excellent presentation. Very, very cool. Uh, so yeah, we're going to start up the uh, Q&A now. So uh, they're going to take the mic around. And if you have a question, just raise your hand and someone will hand you a mic. And uh, I'll repeat the question so that we make sure we get it recorded. And we'll start taking those. There's one up here in the front. It's tough because I can't see at all. There's these huge lights, and it's like I can't see who's got their hand raised. So they're, they're, uh, someone's helping in the crowd there. Hey there, uh, yep. quick question on your review process, right? When you're doing that many badges, what was your process for creating a concept, getting it in, getting it produced, getting it reviewed, and then getting it in the game? Can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, so the question there was just wanting to know what the process was for uh, your review process for the badges, you know, getting them created and getting them in the game. Uh, there's a lot of trust involved. <laughs> Uh, so basically my concept was all on me. Um, at the outset we had like a designer's wish list of all the badges they want to see. Um, so it's pretty much just me going through that list um, and then, you know, picking them off one by one, more or less. Um, and then there was a Slack channel where, uh, here internally that I post to, they basically go into review by, I don't know, a dozen or so people to give their feedback and those people all vary um, from you know design to our, our team to art direction. Um, yeah, and then once that's approved, it goes into uh, a mirror board um, to kind of indicate its status. And uh, then it's, uh, it's, it just gets imported into the game and hooked up to metadata in all its appropriate locations. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Most of the legwork for um, kind of defining look and feel all happened in pre-production. So like there was, um, you know, in the early stages, there was just, I don't know, 20 or 30 badges. We just kind of said like, yeah, that's it. That's our direction. And then from there, it was just kind of off to the races. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Thank you, guys. All right. So uh, I think they're getting another question here. I do have a question regarding um, why was the decision made to use a Substance Designer to render out the badges? Could you have not just rendered them out in a turntable, let's say in Maya? Like, why did you not do the entire rendering and lighting process inside Maya? That's a, that's a great question. So uh, th they were asking, uh, why did you guys choose to use a 3D uh, Substance Designer to render the badges? Why didn't you just do the whole uh, rendering inside of Maya? Do you want to take it? 
I can you, uh, I, I can start off from like yeah. uh, so uh, so uh, we when we were defining the workflow we took a step back and first look at the team also and their expertise and then plus focus on iteration as well so uh, rendering in Maya and uh, you know was not a particular strength of ours uh, and managing 3D content 3D again as we mentioned while people were familiar with it it's it's not a like a you know uh, comfort zone necessarily while UI team was working towards more in Illustrator Photoshop you know uh, all those kind of tools so we wanted to uh, keep their like core workflow in in that 2D uh, space and hence we kind of moved to social design up for that. Yeah, I can also just add. Um, I think there are some people at Dice here previously who had experience with that pipeline, and they just they just felt it was not a very a very good pipeline. Um, there are some stories about it. Uh, yeah, and apparently it, it, it didn't go well. I um, early on here, I, I as well tried um, some badges in Maya, and um, you know while you can get some cool looks um, and. I guess you're maybe a little less limited in the looks you can create with the 3D application. Um, at the end of the day, it just came down to the scale again, like and the time problem. So those are two big factors, and then also it's, it's it was a question of specialization. Um, once at the end of the day, when you get into designer, I'm sure most people know you're just as an artist, like you're always told, like just focus on the hype, and like that's. Um, once you wrap your head around that, it's it's you know it's 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 node based node based geometry creation. It's modeling with nodes, so it's it's a little more straightforward than navigating around um, a three D space. It just takes a little bit of more time to get used to. Great, yeah. thank you guys. Yeah. Oh, you got another one here in the front, or maybe there's more in the back. Can't see the back. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, one question on the learning slide. You are mentioning that you generate the badge right inside the engine using the Substance integration. Does it mean that you are using the Substance engine at the runtime of the game? Uh, so, so, I can take that. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Substance engine in, uh, in like Substance in, uh, integration in Frostbite is, is not uh, runtime at present. and. Uh, we are definitely not going to use it at runtime in the beginning. We're going to use that as like uh, imagine substance player where you load a SVSAR file and uh, you know generate outputs from there with some parameterization. So we are not there yet. These are learnings and next steps kind of. So we are exploring that space. But maybe sometimes at uh, runtime in the future. You know, who knows? Cool. That's awesome. That that question doesn't count. That was from Pierre. He works here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's uh, any any other questions? I'm not. I'm not sure, guys. I can't. It's, I know you can't see, but like I can't see the crowd, so I don't know if they have their hand raised. I'm waiting for the 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 staff to help. Wait, that's it, Tal. Okay. All right. I think that's it for the questions. Hey, guys, thank you so much for your time. Thank you.